Have you never been able to find a sport that fits you or one that you like? Are there certain restrictions that make you feel unable to play a sport, such as age, height, weight, sex, or maybe even the change of seasons, locality, or maybe even a physical handicap? Well, why not give bowling a try? Bowling can be played by anyone, man, woman, child, of practically any age and for people of all sizes. It's a simple and gentle sport, yet it is also very challenging. It requires coordination, concentration, accuracy, and consistency. Putting all these elements together gives you a game that is so beautiful to watch and fun to play. This is what makes bowling so fascinating to those who study it. We hope you will share in this enthusiasm as you watch and study this program. So let's get started. First of all, let's look at the actual bowling lane, or alley as it is sometimes called. Each lane is 62 feet, 10 and 3 16 inches in length and 42 inches wide. Along each side are 9 inch gutters that catch any misdirected bowling balls. The lane begins with a foul line, and just beyond it are a series of dots, or dowels, and arrows which are known as range finders. These are used in aiming your bowling ball. The area in which you stand to make your delivery is known as the approach area. The approach extends 16 feet from the foul line back. Embedded in the floor of the approach are three rows of dots parallel with the arrows on the lanes. One row of seven dots is two inches from the foul line, the second row is 12 feet, the third row is 15 feet from the foul line. There can be either five or seven dots in the last two rows. The purpose of these dots is for determining proper starting position. Because of the pounding the lane absorbs, the front part is made of maple, a hardwood. So is the back part, where the falling pins give it a severe pounding. However, to give the ball more traction, the middle part of the lane is made of a softwood, usually pine. Each lane is 39 boards wide. The pins are set up in a triangular arrangement on the pin deck. It measures 36 inches. They are spaced so it measures 12 inches from the center of one to the center of another. They are made of a laminated hard rock maple and then covered with a strong plastic coating. They measure 15 inches high and can weigh from 2 pounds 14 ounces to 3 pounds 10 ounces. The pins are numbered 1 through 10, starting with the head pin being number 1 and the following in order from left to right, moving back with each row. The walls on either side of the pin deck are very important as the pins knocked over by the ball bounce off the wall and into other pins. This is called wall action and it counts just the same. Of course, the most important single piece of player equipment in bowling is the bowling ball. Right from the start, it can make or break your game. You may want to use the bowling lane ball provided by the bowling lanes, which is drilled for everyone, whether right or left-handed. Be patient. Be sure to take the time to search for the best weighted bowling ball for you, one that is comfortable, because they range from 8 pounds to a maximum of 16 pounds. The lane bowling balls are usually stamped with a weight. Sometimes the weights are number-coded or color-coded. If you are unfamiliar with the codes at a particular bowling lane, don't hesitate to ask the desk personnel. The weight of the ball, of course, is a matter of preference depending on strength and coordination rather than how much a person weighs. You need to choose the heaviest bowling ball you can deliver without undue strain. This will give you a good mix and a better chance for a strike. Using a bowling ball that is too light for you won't provide the best pin action. Nothing is worse than a loose-fitting bowling ball that flies out of your hand or so tight that it promises to drag you down the lane behind it. In order to bowl your best, you must have a bowling ball that is properly drilled and fits you, matching both your hand and your style of play. Some questions you might ask yourself in regard to whether your bowling ball has the correct weight for your particular style of bowling are, number one, am I in control of the swing? Number two, is there too much strain on my hand and arm? Number three, is the ball too light or too heavy? Bowling balls normally have three holes for the thumb, the middle finger, and the ring finger. When looking for a house ball, the size of each hole should be comfortable and snug enough for controlling the bowling ball. First, check the thumb hole. After inserting the thumb, rotate it several times. If you can feel the slightest friction, the fit is proper. Although the holes of your middle finger and ring finger shouldn't be too tight, they do need to fit a little more snugly than the thumb hole. You should be able to feel some friction between them and the sides of the holes. The reason the thumb hole needs to be a bit looser is because your thumb is the first to come out when you release the ball, and it must do this easily and smoothly. Your fingers remain behind it for a split second and need to lift the ball to provide the proper kind of roll. 
Unless the holes are a bit on the snug side, your fingers will lose their grip too easily. And while we were on the subject of gripping the bowling ball, I would like to mention the various grips that can be used. For the conventional grip, your middle finger and ring finger should be inserted through the second joints comfortably, and your thumb should be inserted full length in the thumb hole. You'll probably have to use this grip because all centers drill bowling balls with this in mind. A second grip, the semi-fingertip, is when your fingers go into a point midway between the first and second joints and the thumb is inserted full length. And the third grip, the full fingertip, is when the fingers are only inserted to the first joints and the thumb is inserted full length. The distance between the thumb and finger holes on the bowling ball is called the span. Proper span is really as vital to your playing ability as are correct weight and finger hole sizes. If your ball has too narrow or too wide a span, it will weaken your grip. If this happens, your hand will tire too quickly and the ball will seem to weigh much more. This will drastically affect your accuracy. A good general test of the proper span for the house bowling ball is to insert your thumb the full distance into the thumb hole and place the rest of your hand on top of the ball with the fingers lying across the holes. The second joint of the middle finger and ring finger should lay approximately one quarter of an inch over the inner edge of the respective holes. Once you have the knack of the game, you really should try to purchase your own bowling ball. Only by owning your own ball can you be assured that you have the proper fit for the size of your fingers, the span of your hand, and the particular grip you will be most comfortable with. House bowling balls are fine, but the finger holes are drilled to fit the average hand and can be used for either right or left-handed players. The probability of finding a proper fit would be remote. You can purchase a bowling ball at the bowling center or at the pro shop. The bowling balls arrive blank, meaning they have no finger holes. After determining the weight that is best for you, the dealer will then measure your exact hand span and the size of your thumb and fingers so that the properly sized holes can be drilled. Make sure your bowling ball is measured and drilled by an expert. You'll need to practice for a while to get your game back to normal, simply because the feel will be unfamiliar to you at first. Also, even with an expert drilling job, the size of the holes still may not be as comfortable as you would like. They can be adjusted with a file, sandpaper, a carving knife, or tape, just like the pros do. If the edges of the holes are too sharp, you can also remedy the situation with sandpaper. The shoes you wear while bowling are specifically made for the surface of the approach and for the specific style of the game of bowling. Because one foot does need to slide a little when you deliver the ball, the shoe for that foot has a leather sole. The sole of the other shoe is made of rubber, giving you traction for your delivery. The heels of both shoes are made of rubber. If you rent shoes at the bowling center, the soles of both shoes will be leather. If you bowl very much, you really should purchase your own bowling shoes, both for hygienic reasons and also because your own shoes will give you a better footing, which will help your game. Remember to check your soles when you return to the approach area from any part of the bowling center. You may have stepped in something on your way back, which could be bad for your sliding or breaking action. And never wear your bowling shoes for any purpose but bowling. Just a few words on appropriate clothing. Of course, you want to be comfortable while bowling. So wear clothes that give you a complete freedom of movement for the arm swing and delivery. Practically all sports stores and bowling lanes carry special bowler accessories. None are absolutely needed, but you may find that they're helpful to your game at some point. There are accessories that hold the wrist firm and gloves and rosins that give you a better grip on the bowling ball. The absolute essentials for a good game of bowling are the ball, shoes, and comfortable clothing. On top of that, you'll need to be willing to work for concentration, accuracy, and consistency and to enjoy what you're doing. Up to now, we have seen what the lane consists of and the equipment needed. Now let's bowl. If you are a beginning bowler, it is highly recommended that you start out with a four-step approach. This is the classic way of delivering the ball, and all other footwork patterns are derived from it. For example, the three and five-step approaches. We'll now describe the four-step approach, starting with a basic but very important stance, and continuing on to the actual delivery and follow-through. The stance is the position taken as you stand ready to roll the ball, which is also known 
as the point of origin. It's simple to get a general idea how far back from the foul line you should start. Start approximately two inches from the foul line with your back to the pins. Take four normal walking steps, then add a half a step for your slide. You now have established your point of origin. Now facing the pins, we must find a position in our stance where holding the bowling ball will be comfortable. Set your shoulders parallel to the foul line. Feet aim directly at the pins. Place your feet close together in a normal standing position or one foot slightly ahead of the other. The left one if you are right-handed and the right one if you are left-handed. Your weight should be on the opposite foot you start off with, so it will be easier to shift your weight to your starting foot on the first step. Your starting position may change as you gain experience and learn to adjust to lane conditions. Eventually, where you stand will depend upon Number one, normal approach distance. Number two, conditions requiring a change from normal ball speed. Number three, the angle being played at the time. Make sure you hold the bowling ball with both hands. Place the hand opposite your bowling side under the ball and let it hold most of the weight. The less tired your bowling hand, the greater your accuracy will be. Next, check the position of your hands and arms. Your bowling hand needs to be placed in a comfortable position with your offside hand supporting most of the weight. To help keep your arms straight, tuck in your elbow close to your side or rib cage. Your arm should be like a pendulum during the swing. It must be straight. If you break your wrist or have your elbow outward, the ball will most likely roll off target. For the best results in the approach, make your swing natural and smooth. Don't hurry or force it in an effort to get extra speed. For example, if your backswing is, let's say, 10 mile an hour, your forward swing and follow through should also be 10 mile an hour. Speed is desirable, but too much will cause loss of control and less pin action. The first step in the three, four, or five step approach is the most important because it's the point of no return. And to execute this step, have both hands move the ball outward and downward from your body. This is called the push away. Extend the bowling arm to full length and let the offside hand leave the ball and extend to the side. This helps keep you balanced and your shoulders parallel to the foul line. The step itself should be slow, just a shuffling half step. I'm using examples for the right-handed bowler, naming the foot on each step taken. But if you are a southpaw, remember to reverse the process. The second step is taken on the left foot and is somewhat larger than the first. It begins at the same time your offside hand leaves the ball and the push away is completed. Your bowling arm swings downward during the step and should arrive at knee height as the step ends. You'll be leaning slightly forward and will remain so throughout the rest of the approach. Keep your shoulders level and parallel with the foul line so the weight of the ball doesn't throw you off balance. During step two, the fingers on your bowling hand should be behind the ball your thumb pointing almost straight down. Your third step is taken on the right foot, the ball arcing in a straight line like a pendulum behind you in the backswing. For most bowlers, the ball should peak at shoulder level as you end the swing upward. Any higher could throw your accuracy off or your balance. Keep your arms straight and your eye on the target during the backswing. The third step is a bit larger than the second, but take it at the same pace. Don't speed yourself up let the weight of the ball set your speed. The fourth step is taken on the left foot and is the longest step in the approach sequence. It is a continuation step and slide. The slide, depending on the player, will vary in length. During the step, bring the ball through the downswing, keep your eyes on the target, and shoulders parallel to the foul line. Continue leaning forward and bend your left knee. Slide on the left foot to a point about two or three inches from the foul line. At the end of the step, your arms extended in front with the ball being released over the foul line. The release of the ball is as important as the approach. It occurs as the sliding foot is coming to a stop. With the proper release, your ball will lay smoothly onto the lane. At the moment of release, you should be leaning forward with your eyes on the target. Your shoulder should be parallel to the foul line your wrist firm, and your arm straight. Concentrate on extending your bowling arm far out over the foul line. In other words, reach for the pins. 
This helps in the follow through. The thumb will come out first with the fingers following a split second later, which will give you proper amount of lift. Lift gives you the amount of roll and hook you're really trying to achieve. Your hand will remain behind or a little to the right of the ball, never with the back of your hand to the pins. As you release the ball, it should be slightly above the lane. You should lean forward, reaching for your target and allow your arm to flow upward in a straight line. This is known as the follow through, which is one of the most important points in your bowling form. It enhances your accuracy. The follow through is completed after the release, but it begins while your fingers are still in the ball. Let your arm do what is natural. Don't force it in one direction or the other, or the ball will go in that direction. Keep your arms straight at least until it reaches shoulder level. Now that we have gone through the proper stance, approach, release, and follow through, it's time for you to try it on your own. The disc will now stop to allow you time to practice these basics. Repeat the procedures as many times as it takes to make you feel really comfortable with the stance and steps. Once you've done this, press normal play and we'll talk about the different ways the bowling ball can be delivered. As far as the actual delivery of the bowling ball is concerned on your first roll of each frame, you need to send the ball to what is known as the 1-3 pocket if you're right-handed and the 1-2 pocket if you're left-handed. This will give you a chance for good pin action and a good strike. The pocket is the space between the 1 and 3 pins and the same for the 1 and 2 pins. There are really four basic deliveries a bowler can use. These four deliveries are number one, the straight ball, number two, the hook ball, number three, the curve ball, number four, the backup ball. I recommend the straight ball or the hook ball. Your delivery depends on the position of your hand, the way your wrist and fingers are at the time of release. Now again, left-handers, please reverse the processes I'm going to describe. For the straight ball, your thumb should be pointing at 12 o'clock your fingers at six o'clock. The thumb is aimed directly at the target and the fingers are beneath the bowling ball. Keep your thumb at 12 o'clock throughout the follow through. That's all there is to it. To make the straight ball most effective, move your point of origin off to the extreme right. The reason for this is because a straight ball is delivered more successfully on a diagonal and this gives you a better angle to enter the one three pocket. Keep experimenting until you find the right spot to enter the one three pocket. The hook ball creates more pin action than any other delivery. It gives a side roll to the ball and the ball travels in a straight line for three fourths of the distance and then the side roll breaks inward, driving it into the one three pocket. Try the center dot for your delivery. But whether you stay here or not will depend on the release and the speed of the roll. If it hooks too sharply, move to the direction of the hook. If it doesn't hook enough, move to the opposite direction. At the release, your thumb should point to the 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, or 9 o'clock position, and your two fingers slightly to the right side of the ball. A good idea of this position is for you to act like you're shaking hands with the pin. As usual, your thumb comes away first, followed by your fingers with a lift at the release. Lift them firmly while moving them slightly counterclockwise. This will make the ball roll counterclockwise, causing it to break inward. The lift is what is important to the hook, so make sure the fingers are firm at the time of release.
In your follow through, reach for the pins as usual. Because of the counterclockwise lift with your fingers and the turn of your wrist, your arm will have a tendency to rise in front of your face, but you should not allow this to happen. Your arm at the completion of the follow through should be in a straight line with the shoulder and the target. The curve is a hook ball with a highly exaggerated arc to it. The ball will run far down to the right side of the lane and curve back into the 1-3 pocket. Make your approach at a slight diagonal so the ball angles to the far right before the inward curve. Your hand rotation and lift are more exaggerated than with the hook ball. Lift your fingers firmly and in a counterclockwise rotation. Depending on the amount of curve and if the ball does perform right, it will curve into the 1-3 pocket. The curve ball is not advised for most bowlers because it's very erratic. The backup is a reverse hook. The ball moves far to the left and arcs inward, making the one-two pocket the target rather than the one-three pocket for the right-hander. The ball is released from the left of center with the thumb pointing at one o'clock or two o'clock or three o'clock position and the fingers underneath and slightly on the left side of the ball. On the release, give your wrist a slight clockwise turn, giving the ball a side roll opposite the hook and the curve for the right-hander. Your hand will rise to the right in the follow-through. Women especially need to be on guard against the backup due to the positioning of one of the muscles in the forearm. There's a tendency to give in to the backup's clockwise spin. Really concentrate on keeping your wrist and forearm straight. The backup ball is not advised for most players. If you bowl this way, you need to try to correct it. However, you may turn out to be one of those rare players who can handle it. There's at hand three distinct aiming systems to help you. They have all proven to be invaluable. The first type of aiming is called pin bowling. You aim the ball at the pins themselves, not paying any attention to the dots or arrows. This style requires you to pick a certain point on the one or three pin. This could be a scuff mark, ring, insignia, or anything that catches your eye. For the left-handers, it will be the one or two pin. So in essence, pin bowling is not highly recommended. Spot bowling is the most recommended aiming system. It brings a target in as close to you as possible. Select a spot on the lane approximately 10 to 15 feet from the foul line. Line it up with your target and roll the ball over it. There are many possibilities for this spot. You can use the dots or arrows or where the maple and pine boards meet. A shaded spot on the board. It's really up to you. Make sure you keep your eyes on the spot and hold it there until the ball rolls over it. The combination of pin bowling and spot bowling is what is known as line bowling. You pick out a series of checkpoints along a line. Draw the imaginary line and roll the ball along it. Use only two or three checkpoints, usually from a spot on the lane to another spot on the lane to the target. Of the three aiming systems, spot bowling is really the best. It gives you the greatest accuracy and can be used with any type of delivery. Problems will crop up in your game as long as you bowl. And no matter how good or experienced you are, every player must learn to endure them. Perhaps you are tired or worried and your timing is off, or maybe you're rushing due to the pressures of competition. Or maybe your style has gradually changed without you even realizing it. Don't become frustrated or angry at yourself. Usually you can determine the reasons for your sudden problems quickly. Just relax and concentrate. Simply try to find out what caused it. Maybe a friend with whom frequently you bowl or a qualified instructor can help you. Whatever the case, Approach it calmly and with a level head, and it will surely work out. Let's go into some common faults and how you can correct them. Your problem may start with your stance being uncomfortable. You may be holding your bowling ball too high or too low, or off to the side too much. Whatever the problem, experiment. Make sure you are relaxed. Take your time. One of the most common problems of a bowler, especially for the beginner, is a bent wrist. It usually starts while the ball is being held in the stance. Breaking the wrist will cause you to drop the ball and the roll will be very inconsistent. Remember, your wrist should be firm and straight throughout the stance. If you break the wrist position, 
you can easily lose control of the ball and lose accuracy. You may want to consider using a wrist strap to help correct this problem. Several faults can occur in a bowler's arm swing. One is bringing the ball around the hips to the middle of the back. It is caused when you allow yourself to turn sideways to the target and bring the ball in behind the body on the backswing. The downward swing then becomes a sideways arc. The elbow ends up being helplessly out and away from the body at the release. Your fingers then also end up where they should never be on top of the ball. Carefully practice your arm swing. Make certain your elbow is close into your side. In bowling, there are a number of ways you can be off balance as you slide and release the ball. You can rear back, which means you are keeping your body too straight, and making it impossible to release the ball low enough to the floor without losing your balance. Or, you may lean out too far to the side, or your offside arm may not be extended enough to serve as a counterbalance. If you are having trouble with this problem, go back to study the fundamentals of the release, which is in Chapter 4 of this program. You may sometimes, in the urgency of competition, do what is known as rushing the foul line. Hurrying to release the ball will only damage your swing and accuracy. You need to practice until you can tell what an easy pendulum swing feels like. A guaranteed way to protect against rushing is to check your left foot, or right foot if you're left-handed, after finishing the roll. If it's pointed straight at the target, all is well. If it's turned inward, slow down. If you feel you are rushing, consciously slow down your approach and take your steps more deliberately. Now that we have covered the basics of bowling and ways to improve, if you are already bowling, let me go over the main points you need to remember every time you bowl. First of all, we've covered the lane itself, and most of this is basic information. But do keep in mind that the dots or the dowels or the arrows are called rangefinders are used in aiming your bowling ball. The dots on the approach are there to help you determine your proper point of origin. In chapter two, I discussed the importance of finding a bowling ball with the proper weight, span, and finger hole sizes. Some points to remember are, number one, choose the heaviest bowling ball you can deliver without putting too much strain on your hand and arm. Number two, if your bowling ball has too narrow or too wide of a span, it will weaken your grip. A good test, again, if you're using a house ball, is to insert your thumb full length into the thumb hole and place the rest of your hand on top of the bowling ball with your fingers lying across the holes. The second joint of your middle and ring fingers should lay approximately one quarter of an inch over the inner edge of the respective holes. Number three, the thumb hole and finger holes shouldn't be too tight, yet they should be snug enough to feel some friction between your fingers and the sides of the holes. The thumb hole should be just a bit looser than the finger holes, since your thumb comes out of the ball first during the release. If you choose to purchase your own bowling ball, Remember to have it measured and drilled by an expert. By owning your own bowling ball, you can be assured of the proper fit, correct span, and the desirable weight. Remember that the house bowling balls are drilled to fit the average hand and can be used for either right or left handers. So your finding a bowling ball that fits perfectly would be remote. In summarizing chapter three, I pointed out that the shoes worn while bowling are made for the surface of the approach so you can slide and at the same time gain better traction when needed. While the center shoes both have leather soles, shoes that you purchase are designed for either left or right handers. The foot you slide on has a leather sole, while the opposite sole is made of rubber to give you better traction. The main point to remember about the bowling shoes is this. Never wear your bowling shoes for any purpose but bowling. Of course, you want to be comfortable while bowling, so wear clothes that give you a complete freedom of movement for the arm swing and delivery. The fundamentals of stance, approach, delivery, and follow-through were covered in Chapter 3. The approach we focused on is the four-step approach, where there were three steps taken, with the last one being a combination of step and slide. 
To determine your point of origin, start approximately two inches from the foul line with your back to the pins and naturally step off four and a half steps. Your stance should be comfortable to you as you hold the bowling ball with both hands, letting your offside hand carry most of the weight. As you start the approach, be sure your elbow is tucked in close to your side. This keeps your arm straight. Remember to make your swing natural and smooth and don't rush the foul line or put too much power in your swing. As you make the steps in the approach, be absolutely certain your arm is kept straight throughout your downswing and delivery. Keep your eyes on the target and shoulders level and parallel with the foul line. Don't speed yourself up. Keep your pace smooth and let the weight of the ball set your speed. At the moment of release, you should be leaning forward with your eyes on the target. Your shoulders again should be parallel with the foul line, your wrist firm, and your arm straight forward. You should reach for the pins, letting your arm flow upward. This is the follow through, one of the most important points in your bowling form. The various styles of delivery studied in chapter five were the straight ball, hook ball, curve ball, and the backup ball. You can go back to this chapter to see how each style is rolled and the correct form for each. I personally recommend the straight or hook ball. Both the curved ball and the backup are too inconsistent and erratic. These are not recommended for most bowlers and can cause you a great deal of trouble, so make sure your wrist is firm and forearm is straight. Chapter six explained the three types of aiming systems which have proven to be invaluable to the game of bowling. These three systems are pin bowling, spot bowling, and line bowling. Of these systems, spot bowling is really the best. It gives you the greatest accuracy and it can be used with whatever type of delivery you choose. And then our last chapter pinpointed some common faults experienced by both beginning bowlers and those who are already bowling. The main things to remember here are to relax, concentrate on what you're doing and what you are about to do, and then execute each move naturally, remembering the basics with each step. In conclusion, you can see why people say, bowling is an easy game to learn, but a difficult sport to master, and this is really the essence of bowling. But once you begin, you find there's so much more to learn. That's what makes this sport so fascinating. It's why bowling remains the most exciting participant sport in the country and why the professionals work so hard at it. Everything we've covered here is designed to help you become a better bowler and to help you perfect your individual style. But knowing about bowling isn't enough. You've got to practice, practice, and practice some more. I hope that you will profit from this program. Remember, bowling is a sport that lasts a lifetime. As you have learned in the preceding segments, there are 10 pins set in a triangular arrangement on the pin deck. The object of the game is to knock down all 10 pins. You're allowed two attempts in each turn. If you succeed on the first attempt, it's called a strike. If it takes two tries, it's a spare. If you fail on both tries, it's marked as a miss. The scoring is really easy. There's one basic rule to remember, and the rest is simple addition. The rule simply stated is, a spare is worth 10 points plus the amount of pins knocked down on the next ball. A strike is worth 10 points plus the amount of pins knocked down on the next two balls. That's all there is to it. If you don't knock down all the pins with either one or two rolls of the ball, that is, if you don't get a strike or a spare, you score the number of pins you did knock down from zero to nine. Here are some examples. Suppose on your first ball, you knock down nine pins. On the score sheet provided by the bowling center, mark a nine in the first small box. If the spare is made, a slash mark is made in the second box to indicate a spare. Now remember the rule. A spare is worth 10 points 
plus the amount of pins knocked down on the next ball. If it were seven pins, your score would be 10 for the spare, plus seven for the pins knocked down on the next ball for a total of 17. If you once again made a spare, then got a strike on your next ball, your score would be 10 points for the spare, plus 10 for the number of pins knocked down on the next ball. This adds 20 points to your score, which then gives you a total of 37 for those frames. Remember, when a spare is made, you have to mark a score down after the next ball is thrown. After a strike, you do nothing until two balls have been thrown. If you made a strike, then knocked down six pins, don't do anything yet in that frame. Remember the scoring rule. A strike is 10 points plus the amount of pins knocked down on the next two balls. If on the second shot, you knock down two of the four remaining pins, the scoring would go like this. 10 points for the strike, plus six for the first ball, plus two for the second ball. This gives you a total of 18 points. If your strike was followed by a spare, the scoring would be 10 for the strike, plus 10 for the number of pins knocked down on the next two balls. You would then add 20 to your score. If you make a strike followed by a second strike, you do nothing until the next ball is thrown. Remember, a strike is 10 plus the next two balls. If you were fortunate enough to get a third strike, you would add 30 pins to your score. If you continue to strike, the same rule applies. 10 points plus the total of the next two balls. A string of strikes can add up in a hurry. Part of the fun of scoring and also an important part of the game are the symbols used on the score sheet. You should learn them and use them. They tell a story about how the game progressed and will give you an indication in which areas you may need to improve. We've already shown you the symbols for a strike and a spare. The remaining ones are the miss, the split, the converted split. Let's take a look at how you might score a sample game. You rolled your first ball and knocked down nine pins. The second ball knocks down the remaining pin. Give yourself a spare. On the first ball of the second frame, you get seven pins. Your score is now 17 in the first frame. Your second ball fails to hit any pins, and you score a miss. You then add seven to your total. The third frame is a strike. Mark in the X, but no score is logged at this point. In the fourth frame, you get another strike, but don't do anything yet. You still have another roll coming. On the first ball of the fifth frame, you get nine pins. You then add 10 for the first strike, then 10 and nine for the next two balls. You have now increased your score by 29 pins. The second ball misses the single standing pin. So your score for the fourth frame will be 10 for the strike plus nine, which is the total of your next two balls. Since you did not score a strike or spare in the fifth frame, you simply add the number of pins knocked down. On your next ball, you get eight pins leaving a split. You convert the split on the second ball and you now have a spare going for you. In the seventh frame, you score another strike. That gives you 10 for the spare plus 10 for the strike for an additional 20 points. The eighth frame is also a strike. Remember, do nothing at this point you still have another roll coming on your seventh frame strike. In the top of the ninth frame, you get six pins on the first ball. You then add 26 pins for your seventh frame strike. On the second ball of the ninth frame, you pick up only three of the remaining pins. This gives you 10 for the eighth frame strike plus an additional nine for the next two balls. Since you did not score a strike or spare in the ninth frame, you simply add the total number of pins knocked down. Just as the spare and strike offer a scoring bonus for doing well, so does the tenth and final frame. If you score a strike in the tenth frame, you get two additional balls. If you get a spare in the tenth frame, you earn 
one additional throw. In our sample game, let's say you knocked down nine pins and then converted to spare. You have now earned an additional roll on which you get a strike. You then score 10 for your spare and 10 for the next ball, which was a strike. This adds an additional 20 pins to your score for a grand total of 175. Keeping score, even for the beginner, shouldn't be a problem. Now, to make sure you understand the process of scoring, we will stop the disc and give you an opportunity to practice. Just follow the instructions on the screen. Now that you've had instruction on the basics of bowling, the next step is up to you. Bowling is a game that can be played and enjoyed by almost everyone. So let's bowl.